is our What Makes a Really Good Newsletter, uh, where we're going to look at some of our favorite newsletters that we get, uh, why we like those newsletters so much, share some insights about our own newsletters that we send, and try to give you some tips for crafting better email newsletters. Uh, we've got some special guests during this webinar, uh, a couple of guys that know something, a uh, thing or two about really good newsletters. Uh, I'm Jason Rodriguez. I'm the community and product evangelist at Litmus, uh, which I like to say is a fancy way of teaching, saying that I teach people about email design, email marketing strategy, all that good stuff, just how to send emails better. Uh, I'm joined with, by Matt Helbig and Matthew Smith from Really Good Emails. I'll let you guys kind of take it away and introduce yourselves. Yeah, I'm Matthew Smith. I like to go by Matthew for a couple of reasons. Uh, there are way too many Matt Smiths in the world already, and I work with like 1,503 Matts, and so having that little HEW helps a ton. Uh, I love uh, working on this stuff, and I love being here. I'm a big fan of uh, Litmus and, and just really uh, this community. So, And thanks for being uh, fans of really good emails. We're always humbled by that, so appreciate being here. Yeah, I'm Matt Helbig. Uh, I do a lot of community stuff at Really Good Emails. I uh, work on the Feedback Friday. I'm in charge of email submissions and making a fun experience for our community and try to get the best resources out there for all these email geeks. Yeah, I, I feel like I've known both of you guys for quite a while now, but I still get confused by how many mats there are. Really good <laughs> exactly. <emails. laughs> So today we're going to be talking about email newsletters. Uh, I I feel like this is a kind of funny slide. What is an email newsletter? Because it seems uh, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, so an email newsletter, as we define it, is kind of anything that you send with some sort of roundup of articles, news, updates. Uh, that's not something like a product update. That's not a dedicated email about some specific feature that you've released or a product. It's not a transactional email. It's nothing that you send that's account-based or anything like that, although it kind of have aspects of uh, pulling in for information from your account or kind of personalizing based on your account or your activities. Uh, but email newsletters are awesome. They're those things we all get in our inbox, uh, keep us up to date on happenings for companies. They can be you know, news briefs, things like that, but it's just this collection of links and resources and articles that a lot of subscribers love getting. Um, so if you're not sending email newsletters, which hopefully you are, I imagine that most of you are probably sending some sort of email newsletter. There's a couple of reasons why you might want to rethink that and start investing in sending an email newsletter for yourself or for your company. Uh, the main thing I like is that email newsletters are kind of, it's it's like the heart of email marketing in my, my opinion. Uh, it's where a lot of the love and the trust, trust is built between the sender and the subscriber. It's where you can provide a ton of valuable content for them without just defaulting into that traditional sales model or that sales mode where you're just trying to hit them over the head with some offer or some deal. It allows you to build this, this connection using really well curated, well crafted content that subscribers love uh, without you know just being that sales guy in the email. Uh, it's a great way to build that trust. You can do really cool things. Uh, you can personalize newsletters. We'll see how some of these companies do that uh, through the examples that we've seen, and you can just kind of build that better relationship. Uh, and it also, you know, I, at the end of the day, tends to result in better business, better money for your company. Uh, it's one of those things that helps keep your brand at top of mind. Uh, it helps you to keep people, keep your company in their thoughts when they it comes time to actually make purchases or do some sort of business. Uh, so even though it, newsletters traditionally aren't something that's uh, sales driven or revenue driven, uh, it's still something that can work towards uh, growing that bottom line for your company. And we'll see too how some of these companies, some of these newsletters bring in product messaging, uh, bring in some of those sales aspects into their newsletters to help drive those business goals as well. Um, but a lot of different reasons that you should be sending email newsletters. They're fun to make, they're fun to for subscribers to actually read through and get, uh, mm -hmm. and they can do a lot of different things for your business. Any other uh, reasonings why you guys love the newsletter so much? I, you know, I think for me, uh, I fell in love with uh, all things email, but you know, the first intro to that was newsletters because it was a way that I could say, hey, company, will you keep in touch? Like, will you do some of the work? Can you be in relationship with me? Um, and unlike something like social that I was, you know, having to either get pinged by and, and sort of, uh, you know, there's a lot of problems with social email to me, at least it has the opportunity to feel like I'm in a little bit more direct relationship. Yeah. Um, 
And I like that. Uh, I feel like I potentially have a little bit more connection to the company and they're serving me by landing in my inbox for me and I get to choose how to interact from there. So I like that. I think same thing for me, uh, you know, email newsletters, I feel like every brand kind of has to have one nowadays. And, you know, when, when you look forward to getting them in your inbox, that's, you know, kind of the goal that we're looking for with really good emails is finding these email newsletters that feel really personalized, feel one-to-one -one and are very uh, much a dialogue with the, the customer and providing value each week or biweekly or whatever cadence you're going to send. And I think it's really great. Yeah, yeah. totally agree. Yeah, I like, uh, I think Kevin Mandeville used to have a quote, something around the lines of, you know, the best email marketers are the ones that uh, create that expectation in the inbox. Like when you when you want to receive their e email, uh, if you know you're going to open it before you actually get that email, then that's an awesome newsletter. Those are good brands and mm -hmm. people do good work. Um, we think these, these examples we're going to go through are kind of exemplify that. Um, so let's look at some of the newsletters we love uh, and some of the things you can learn from them. So we picked, uh, I think there's 13 in here, which we were joking about. It's going to be tricky to actually get through <laughs> all 13 of those. Uh, since we're going to look at each one, we're going to kind of point out what we love, what we might not love as much about those newsletters and just really where they excel. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll just dive in and see where we go. If we're running short on time, then we might skip a couple of the later ones, uh, but try to post recap uh, on our blog later on next week. Um, so let's talk about this first one, Inside Design by Envision. Uh, I have a feeling a lot of people get this newsletter. Uh, we've been getting it mm -hmm. for years and we've kind of seen the evolution of this newsletter. Uh, I got a pretty heavy design revamp a couple of months ago, I want to say. Um, okay. Let's let's pop this open and see what it looks like and why it works so well. Uh, so this is Inside Design. Uh, Envision, if you don't know them, are a company that build uh, kind of prototyping and collaboration tools for designers, for product designers, web designers, whatever. Um, but they've been sending this uh, type of newsletter that kind of rounds up a lot of their blog posts, uh, different types of updates for their product, and just really cool design news uh, from across the industry. Um, so full of links, full of cool stuff. Uh, I guess, Matthew, do you want to take this one and kick off why you love this one so much? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so one of the things that is uh, right out of the gate is really amazing from um, Envision consistently is they just follow some of the table stakes that are really important to a good email, right? Like uh, they do custom typography and it's uh, live text, right? Which is really important for accessibility, which is sort of foundational, but then also it helps us move toward the future of email so that, you know, we are able to do multivariate testing faster. We're able to like uh, be more controlled in our emails and moving them toward design systems and things like that. So I always love seeing them push like best in class um, uh, sort of principles. And then one of the things that I find is they're always finding little ways. Uh, can you stop right there on the yep. where it says link, links? Um, this is a great example. So traditionally, somebody would take that gray background and then they would make that the container. But between design and dev, uh, they've figured out uh, how to have a nice overlap there, which in the email space gets you that feeling of like, oh man, like you, you don't think about that. You feel it like this. This feels more like web than what you normally see in email because those are the kinds of things that aren't often being done in email. Um, another one would be that uh, the links themselves, uh, the underlines of those are being uh, done through CSS in some unique ways. And I, I'm, I haven't looked at this uh, to see what it um, degrades to, but little things like that make a difference, right? Aesthetically, it stands out as like, this is unique. They do follow some uh, traditions that are, you know, pretty uh, standard. Like they give you like a one column layout and then a three column layout. But even like this uh, video where you get a black background and the movie or the video rather like overlaps, that's really nice. You know, um, I, I think some of those details, uh, they repeat it down through the email. Another thing is there's just not that much variation, right? Like uh, I like to, as a designer, I like to play like almost like uh, design golf, which is get the lowest score possible. So every time there's a little difference in your design, um, you, you're adding a point, right? So every time there's a different like font weight, font type, uh, every time there's a different color, 
And so think about all those differences and they do a fantastic job of getting those down to the like the smallest number so uh, really consistently uh, the team over there uh, just does a great job and I'm, I'm always impressed so uh, yeah I, I like that that comment about consistency and like mm -hmm. yeah there's not a lot of variations but it doesn't ever feel boring and I, I think that's due to this yeah a lot of this overlapping and they, they could very easily just fall back on like a typical grid based layout and not really have these overlaps, but it is those touches that take something that's really consistent, but steps it up to that next level. Right. Um, yeah, I love it. Absolutely love it. Matt, how about you? Yeah, for me, this one, I think I was going to use Matthew's favorite word, which is white space, pretty much like there's a <laughs> literal like let's let's the content really breathe in this email uh, and it's how it's laid out really brings your eyes down the email as well. And I don't, for me, to me, this like feels like it takes advantage of that desktop view. And then on mobile, I think it has a really good design as well. But uh, yeah, I think they just do some really interesting, small little dev things that, you know, spice up the email with the hover effects and rollover effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, you know, are a nice touch. And it really shows that they kind of cared about this content and, you know, thought about this template for a while. And um, each week, too, I mean, this is a very versatile template. People can throw in different content all the time. And so. I think it's a really nice, um, you know, just a, a, gr a great template and a, a good email to to look at and reference and think about. Yeah, I love it. Love the the interactivity here. Those roller rollover and hover effects are awesome because uh, they're really subtle, but they add that level of interactivity uh, that a lot of emails don't don't really rely on or uh, bother with right. adding. Um, right. So all all around, and really great email. A point on that to raise too is that that's audience driven, right? So their audience cares about that kind of thing because yeah, it's totally. a design audience, right? So if this was uh, for um, steel manufacturers, you know, probably hover effects are not like where you should be spending your time. Like yep. find a different, more potent feature that matters to that audience. But to this audience, this stuff is sexy and I love it. Yeah, awesome. So that's inside design and vision. We love the copyright and the design. Uh, and like Matthew just mentioned, you know, it's really valuable to, to the audience because they know their audience so well and tailor all of their content to that audience and all the little design details um, feel very in line with the values that the audience cares about, uh, which is absolutely awesome. Uh, the next one is Trello. So Trello's tips. Uh, so this one, I know we talked about uh, it, it being very simple and succinct, uh, which is great for a newsletter. It's not overwhelming in any way. Uh, and it's also a good mix of news and product. But I think there are a couple other points that you guys wanted to touch on too when we start talking about this Trello newsletter. Yeah, yeah for me, I really like that card design. Uh, I think those rounded edges really are fantastic to see when we can do them in a, an email. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just in general, these, these colors really like pop out and stand out in the inbox. I think it's almost like that gradient background as well. Like, I think little touches like that, you know, make an email stand out when everyone else is just doing maybe like a white background and, you know, black text. So this pop of color and the custom illustrations and everything else in this layout just seems to really work for this brand as well. Yeah, I, I really, uh, I enjoy it for a bunch of the same reasons. Um, consistent uh, text size. It's easy relatively to scan. There's some things that I would improve that I'll mention here in a minute, but um, you know, overall I can, I can read the content, I can take action. I can read the content, I can take action. Now, one thing that I would say for me personally in the, the Trello emails, there's a couple of things. Um, there's so many illustrations and they're so beautiful and so kind of potent that sometimes I feel personally, like it takes away from the text, which is actually the point of the email. And so if it were me, and, and I haven't tested this, right? So these are, these are hypotheses, but if it were me, I would test having, maintaining these illustrations, but using them a little bit more uh, subtly or uh, maybe not quite as frequently. And then another thing that would improve scannability of this email is uh, under the main illustration, they start with centered text and then a CTA. And then they go to uh, left aligned text twice and then back to centered. It's okay here, but generally speaking as a typography rule, if you're going to make a switch like that, 
you need more white space and or what's like some kind of horizontal rule or break mm -hmm. yeah. to reset your mind. Um, and so here it doesn't work quite as well. I understand why they did it because of the icon, et cetera, but it could be improved. Um, so uh, there's a lot of studies been done um, around like, uh, you know, the speed at which somebody can quickly scan text to see what, you know, what they want to read. The other thing is that in this text, uh, it's short enough where it, it probably works, but generally speaking, if you have a bolded heading with uh, additional copy, that is the fastest way to be able to scan something. So a quick you know, uh, heading that is either larger or somehow hierarchically like easier to, to read than the body copy, you can scan it and then quickly you decide, ooh, I wanna read paragraph three. That's the one that pertains to me. So the service to the customer there is that in the design, you're being more specific and helping them see what content pertains to them more quickly. Um, you can also begin to do that through segmentation and personalization uh, so that you're getting you know, more specific content into specific people's hands. But just with design alone, you can do a lot. Yeah, so this is a case where it almost seems like like we, we value consistency, but if it's too consistent, then it kind of works against usability. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I totally agree. One of the things we, we've been talking a lot about at Litmus about accessibility and email lately um, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, but I totally agree with I, the switching between that context switch between centered and left line text creates some accessibility issues. Um, somebody that might have some sort of reading disability or cognitive disability, they could encounter this and it's really difficult for them to get through because there's all these different starting points that your eye has to work through to actually consume that content. So right. even just, yeah, adding that white space might be a good idea. Uh, I do love though how it's it feels, it's like their product. Like the, the <laughs> colors, the design, those rounded corners like Matt mentioned, it feels like a card inside of Trello, which if you ever use Trello, this is what their product feels like. Um, so I really like that their design is so influenced by their product and you immediately know that this is a Trello email, this is a Trello newsletter. Um, and I think that consistency, that cross channel kind of brand consistency is really valuable too. Agreed. Cool. Uh, so the next one is from Marvel. So this is uh, from the Marvel blog. Uh, Marvel, again, is another design tool uh, that allows you to collaborate and build prototypes, I believe. Um, <laughs> a couple of things we loved were just the colorful design, how friendly it was on mobile devices, uh, how usable it was, and how, again, how well they seem to know their audience. Um, so maybe Matt Helbig, you can uh, kick off this one for us. Sure, yeah, I think this layout works really well for a lot of brands. This very, I guess, mm -hmm. again, card with the with the rounded edges. Uh, I think, yeah, I think we might have some comments around the, the text length being a little different with some of those cards. But I think in general, this layout works pretty well. And then, as you said, on mobile, this I think people are very um, familiar with that tapping sort of motion. Um, so on mobile, especially with this audience, potentially, um, you know, I think people are willing to, you know, tap these different modules and really tap into them if they if they enjoy the content. Uh, I think one comment might be these CTAs. They're all pretty basic. Uh, I think we sometimes mm -hmm. recommend, you know, trying some different other language rather than just read more, learn more. So I think they might want to experiment with something like that where similar to Envision, they have some of those more descriptive CTAs. Mm -hmm. Another thing I would add to the CTA here is that they're all the same weight. And so one of the things I think works really well, and actually um, I'm speaking as a, uh, from experience with de um, web design, and I haven't done any email tests in this regard and would love any feedback on my advice here or my thought, but it's that if you, uh, right now, all of these CTAs are saying, me, me, I'm important. And when everybody's important, nobody's important, which is kind of what uh, I think you were saying, Jason, before. So the, the opportunity here is to say, if you walk away with nothing else, do this and have one CTA that really like, you know, stands out. And then the others, one, you could make them, you know, lighter gray with dark text, that could, even like green text in this case, or two, 
you could potentially um, you know, make the first one like the green and stand out. And then subsequent CTAs, you could just make links. Um, or you could have one big CTA at the top and one at the bottom, and then the others, you know, be links. So there's lots of ways to achieve uh, this result. Um, and if nothing else, I would I would test that um, in your in your own work and see what you can experience. It just uh, you know that that alone would be a fantastic split test to just see how it happens, see what happens. Yeah, totally. Uh, I, I I like the idea too of yeah, I totally agree. If like everything's important and weighted the same, then nothing is important, and it, it definitely works towards your goals. Um, so I really like the idea of like yeah, having one or two of the green buttons and the rest being text links or like differently styled. And again, around the CTAs, I feel like we're hammering on these CTAs, but I'd love to see some sort of like hover effect. Um, I think mm -hmm. that could help kind of increase that usability and uh, let people know. You know, it just increase that better engagement experience, that better user experience. Um, but I do like how they, it's it's a good mix of like product type stuff. Like this first thing is, it's a newsletter, but it talks about this new feature of Marvel and this new collaboration with Pace. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also have just kind of different news types item, in industry articles, things like that. Um, but then they have like, you know, this cool little start your free trial down here at the bottom. I think that's a good right. mix of content and product stuff. And that's, that's something we'll see in other newsletters too. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind as we're talking about all these newsletters. It doesn't have to just be mm -hmm. uh, random articles and blog posts and stuff like that. You can work that content in there. It's just the way you do it so that it doesn't feel heavy handed or like you're bashing somebody over the head with a product update. I think that's the key for balancing those newsletters and that type of content out. Back to personalization, uh, one of the things that uh, Jorge Selva, who spoke at the Unspam event earlier this year uh, that we put on, um, he had a great example of how um, at um, Reverb, the company that he was working at, yeah, they, yeah. Had, they, had, uh, they were sending out emails uh, to people who had purchased anything. And so uh, if I'm a guitar player, I'm getting uh, emails like this that are sending me uh, potential opportunities to buy drums, guitars, uh, basses, you know, anything. And what they started to do was they said, okay, let's start sending more particular information so we're serving our customers better and just send primarily, you know, uh, drum stuff to, to people who've purchased drums, believing that that's that persona and then small opportunities to continue and learn more, get more but focus on that one thing. And they saw huge growth through that. Yeah. So thing one would be, you know, if you can, like this is quite a long email from Marvel. If you can segment um, now, you know, really good emails. We don't have a big enough team or enough time to do that. You know, it's, we're, you know, 4.5 people like doing way more than anybody should uh, in 10 hours a week, each kind of a thing. But um, when you can, if you can, try that out. And, and then the second thing is, I would actually love to hear from the audience uh, on Twitter. I'm at, uh, at whale on Twitter. Um, let me know like what products you love to do that personalization with. I know there are some I mean, plenty out there, but I'm, I'm really interested in learning more about what people are using. So let me know. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah. I, I get reverbs emails. Uh, I bought, haven't bought any guitars through me. I bought a bunch of cables and stuff and they've definitely improved their kind of personalization segmenting game. Uh, and I just love their emails in general. So if you're a musician, cool. even if you're not, check out their emails are awesome. Uh, so the next one is we present uh, by we transfer. And I think that's a really interesting example um, on top of the beautiful graphics and illustrations, just the overall design. They do things like use real text, which obviously aids accessibility and usability, especially when images are disabled in email clients. Uh, but I think that's a really good example of a brand using their newsletter for more than just product, product stuff and like product related stuff. So it's all about, they even say it in the header here, it's unexpected stories about creative minds. So we transfer is largely just like a file transfer service, but they're using their newsletter and their content to think about the industry in like broader strokes and more deeply about the industry and create it, creativity and all this stuff. And I think that's a really interesting thing we, that a lot of companies don't think about doing. A lot of companies are just sending, you know, news roundups, industry roundups, but this is 
seems like so much more than that. Um, I will say right off the bat, though, one of the things I don't particularly like is how everything is just centered text, um, because that does have those accessibility implications. Um, you can see on like left and line text, there's one left hand side that your eye has to jump to when you start a new line. So you know exactly where that line starts. But for longer bits of copy down here, when it's all center line, that's one, two, three, four, five different starting points for that text, uh, which introduces just kind of slowness to reading that and, you know, hurdles for people that have trouble reading. Um, but beyond that, I think that it's, this email has got a lot of things going for it. Um, Matthew Smith, what do you think about this one? You know, um, one of the things that like gets me excited about an email like this is their content in imagery so imagery if if this imagery was not good i honestly i would be i would have a real hard time with this email there's so many little things that could be improved um in terms of the typography that said i am a typography kind of i don't know what's the word I, i'm <laughs> tough about it yeah like yeah. yeah so i really care about it um there's always more to learn about typography. I, I love when people call me out on things like, that's not actually an orphan, that thing that you said. So like, that's, <laughs> that's great. <a> widow. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> I've always had more to learn and I love it, but the, the imagery sells this. It's amazing. Yeah. That's great. What I will say is to me, color <clears throat> in a heading, um, you know, we you know, always need to be careful with your headings. Uh, in this case, I think they are links, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Is that right, yep. uh, Jason? Yep. Uh, so just make sure that your headings, um, if they're color, that uh, you're creating a design pattern in your email where if something stands out like that, it is a link. Like uh, I've seen people confuse that before, and that can create yeah. kind of a brain confusion. But the other one is, is centered text is great for like two lines. It is very difficult once it gets past two lines. If you ever want to nerd out on typography, go read either Robert Brinkhurst's uh, Elements of Typographical Style, or um, there's a, a new uh, web book uh, out by a guy named Richard Rudder, I think, who's one of my old uh, web friends who did that, but for web. And yeah. it is brilliant and really good. So. Um, I recommend just reading something or if not just you know some good articles to understand some of those principles because in five minutes this email could be like radically improved with just better typography totally but great imagery yeah, yeah i would Matt say almost, i think it's a cheat because of this great imagery you know as well like um, this does feel like a really you know well-designed standalone email experience but we get a lot of questions around, you know, B2B emails and things like that. When you don't have this beautiful imagery, you know, how can you make your emails still engaging? So I think this one is a good example for bringing in different pieces of art and, you know, using a template really well. But I think we definitely acknowledge that not everyone's emails can look as pretty as this. Yeah, true. All right. I think where I'm looking at, I'm keeping an eye on the time here. <laughs> I feel like Whitney's about to jump in and tell me to get on with it. Um, so we looked at a couple of cool email newsletters. We have, I mean, I'll just flip through here. We have a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, but what we'll do is add these to the recap blog posts. And then Matt and Matthew, if you don't mind, you know, just kind of commenting on why you like these so, ones so much or any feedback for these. Yeah. Uh, we'll put that in the blog post, but we wanted to move on and talk about our own newsletters because both Litmus and really good emails send newsletters and kind of give you guys an inside look into that process and some of the insights we've learned. Uh, I will say there's really good emails. I, I, I imagine a lot of you are familiar with it. You guys are working on a new beta version of that. That's at beta.reallygoodemails.com. Uh, I've been using it. It's freaking awesome. Uh, I absolutely love it. You can create your own collections you. and cool stuff. Um, so I went ahead and created a collection for this webinar that has those 13 emails in there. Uh, that's at this bit.ly link. I'll leave it up there for a second. Um, but definitely check that out because that'll allow you to go through all the newsletters that we were talking about today and that we'll recap on the blog post and kind of dig in deeper. You can even pop open the code and see the live emails like we were looking at um, to give you an idea of like what those emails look like and how they're built, right. uh, which is awesome. Um, but let's move on and look at some of the insights from our own newsletters. Um, so Litmus, on the Litmus side, we're going to look at our monthly, our Litmus news, email newsletters that we send out. Um, hopefully a lot of you are subscribed to this. If you're not, go to litmus.com slash subscribe and sign up. Um, but just a real brief recap. These are monthly newsletters. 
Uh, they're collecting a lot of our content that we've released over that past month, whether that's blog articles, podcast episodes, uh, videos, reports, anything we do content wise. Um, but it's also has a couple of elements of, uh, you know, product promotional stuff that we add in there too. Uh, so it's good mix of info and promos. And one thing we've been focusing on more and more as well is kind of working in accessibility best practices into the email as well. Uh, so we'll take a quick look at this one. I'll just kind of walk you through what I mean by some of that stuff. Um, so you can see the content in here. Some of the uh, things we've been focusing on is adding a little bit of interactivity to it. So we have these hover states for all of our CTAs. Uh, you can see even on images, we kind of fade this out to show that it's clickable. Um, again, we're not trying to center all this text, even though you know centered stuff looks symmetrical and nice, uh, but we try to work in accessibility wherever we can. Um, but it's, yeah, a lot of content. Uh, each content block has its own and, you know, different elements. It can have an image, it'll have the copy, the CTA, the background color. Uh, but all this stuff is templated out for us so that we can really quickly curate this and send it and get it out the door. Um, but that all, that template also allows for a lot of flexibility. Um, so I want to go into some of the stuff that we've kind of figured out as we've been sending this over the years. Um, so the first thing is content focus. So what do we, how do we actually decide what goes to the newsletter? Uh, and we like to use this 80-20 rule for content. 80% uh, of it is largely educational stuff. So it's things that we've written, uh, but it doesn't really have like a product focus or a real call to action other than to read this and learn more about the email industry. Um, so we, we want the bulk of our newsletter to be very educational because we found that our audience respects that. They want some sort of educational value from our content. That's what they think of us as kind of thought leaders and ed educators in the email world. Uh, so we focus mostly on that. But then the other 20% are things that are more promotional, whether that's promoting the Litmus Conference, Litmus Live, uh, if it's promoting some new feature, some new email client that we have available in previews. Um, so it's really about finding that right mix of content. And I think that's the case across the board for all the newsletters that we're looking at. Uh, you don't want to be overly promotional. Uh, that's what product update emails and feature updates and uh, some more like transactional type stuff might be better suited for. Um, so you just want to find that healthy mix of like what your subscribers going to get value from and then what your other goals are, what those promotional goals, goals happen to be. Uh, and then the other thing is we try to make data back decisions whenever possible. So we review on a regular basis the performance of all of these campaigns. We look at the blog traffic, the report downloads. We look at all of that data and that helps inform our content decisions for our newsletter. Uh, a lot of times we'll try to, we'll focus on something that, you know, is doing well. We want to promote that more heavily. Um, so we'll put that front and center. But sometimes we'll look at, you know, our blog post analytics, our website traffic, things like that. And we'll see something's not doing that well, but we'll think that it's a really valuable piece of content. So we'll focus on that more. Um, so I think all those things kind of find that right mix, then using the data you have at hand to influence your uh, your content choices in your emails, a really good kind of tactic for building better emails. Um, subject line wise, we do a couple of things too. We definitely test our subject lines and I think that's something that everybody should be doing. Uh, but we don't just necessarily test like short term, like a single campaign on a limited audience, like a limited subset of those uh, recipients. So a lot of times we'll test different types of subject lines across months of these email newsletters going out. Um, so we'll have some sort of like theory of like what type of subject line will work well, and then we'll find the reverse of that. And we'll test those two things over a longer term uh, because that gives us a, a better bit of data to work with as opposed to just a single test uh, in one email sign on a subset of users and kind of having that hold back group that gets the better performer. Um, I think a lot of times that short term look kind of works against you and doesn't allow you to fully test this hypothesis that you're trying to work with. Um, that's another thing is always have a hypothesis in mind when you're putting together your content, when you're writing your subject lines, you want to go into that test uh, with some sort of thought. That, that hypothesis might be proven wrong, uh, but if anything, that's a good thing. That gives you better insights as to uh, how your content's working and how your subscribers think. So always think about that hypothesis before you start testing these things. 
Uh, then the last thing we we learned is that it's really valuable to look beyond just opens when you're testing these things in your emails. Uh, one of the things we found with subject line tests is that we did, it was something really general like March news from Litmus versus uh, video and email, like yes you can, like something that's more content specific. And we found that not only were opens up, but opt-out rates were massively reduced using that subject line. Uh, and that, that gives us a clue as to subscriber intentions, like what they actually value. Because a lot of time opens is kind of a vanity metric. Uh, you want to look at, you know, click through rate, click to open rate, opt out rate, um, and pay attention to where, what links people are opening your newsletters because it's not just opens. And a lot of times subject line testing can be kind of deceptive because you might have a really good clickbaity subject line, but then that content isn't inside of the email or that subject line's not supported. Um, so looking beyond just opens is a really good habit to get into when you're framing these subject lines and your content, your known newsletters. Uh, and then finally, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about our insights into why this design. Um, so uh, a lot of you have probably been following Litmus for a long time and seen a lot of different types of newsletters that we've sent out. Uh, but we've kind of honed in on this type of design, this kind of module card type layout, uh, similar to other emails we've seen. Um, but there are a couple of things that this has going for it. The first is that it's really easy to edit and produce this email campaign. Um, I, I don't want to say that our email team doesn't work hard because they're probably the hardest working uh, email team in the industry, uh, largely because Litmus is an email kind of thought leader, even though I don't like using that word all the time. Uh, so we're under a hell of a lot of scrutiny from our audience. Uh, so they work their butts off to make sure that all of our emails look and function beautifully and the content's on point. Uh, but this type of templated approach allows us to produce these contents um, without as much overhead as doing a completely bespoke design every single time we send a newsletter. That being said, this email template is very, very flexible. Uh, we can create custom imagery for each of these cards. We can change the background colors, the, the type colors, the CTA colors. We can adapt that to the content so that each newsletter, even though it's using one template, feels customized for that content. Um, it's even to the point where we have, I think, future newsletters going to be featuring, talking about an article, a uh, design trend about using gradients in email. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to guess what the backgrounds of all of these content pieces are going to look like in a uh, future send. And then the last thing is it's very focused on being responsive across different device sizes and accessible to the widest range of subscribers we can possibly imagine. Um, so we rely on that live text, that HTML text, as opposed to text and images. Uh, we do things like adding the ARIA rule, so all of our tables to make sure that screen readers don't read those tables out loud. Uh, we do everything we can to make these emails accessible and usable regardless of our subscribers' abilities, their devices, uh, what they're doing at that time of day when they actually open it. Um, so I think if you can take some of those tips, some of those learnings that we've gotten from our own email newsletter and work them into how you think about, strategize, and design and build your own newsletters, then hopefully you'll be sending some really good emails that you know the, the team over at Really Good Emails can actually throw up on their website and talk about in the future. Really good emails, guys. What have you learned from your own newsletters? I, I love that you just said that we could throw up on our website. Because <laughs> I'm, nice, I'm yeah. sort of immature like that. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we, we do the best we can with a tiny team. So for those of you who are on this webinar and are thinking, whoa, I'm blown away by what Litmus uh, you know, is doing that Jason just described, don't worry. I'm blown away too, you know, like that's next level. It's awesome. And when you have a product that is, you know, profitable, that's uh, making money, that is serving customers in a fantastic way, like Litmus does, then you can build a team that can get really intelligent, thoughtful, and, and do some of those things. Um, and man, want to do that. And we hope to get there. Uh, for us, we've got really, you know, this uh, tiny team of uh, four people currently. And, uh, you know, what we what we try and do 
is we focus on, I'll speak to the design and then, and then Matt Helbig, maybe you can you know, touch on uh, some of the specifics of content and some other things, but you know, we just try and follow the, the design techniques that we've just been talking about, right? I want an email to serve our customers. So one, if it's funny, it means that it shows up and somebody gets to laugh today and life is difficult. So if we can make somebody laugh and have a good time and like, kind of, you know, shake off the crap of the day, then we win like that. And we help you win. And we love that. Right. So there's a good example for us, you know, figuring out people's rapper names, like that's just kind of goofy and fun and, and silly and nonsensical and really meaningless, but you know, maybe somebody laughed and that's a, that's like our little good deed for the day. Right. The next is right in this first view, you know, like the scannability of this first piece is just really critical to us being able to quickly go, okay, I know what is going to be in the next paragraph. I, from consistency, I know that that first paragraph is going to be funny because either Mike or myself are usually writing it and we're total goofballs. And then we're going to get some, you know, silly CTAs here to lead us off into the site to show us some good new emails. That's going to be fun, right? Uh, in a, in a side note, if you've been hitting the site in the last like week or two, huge apologies for all the speed things that we've had problems uh, with uh, when we are, we are hurting, but thankfully it's one of those weird, like uh, Murphy's law things. The beta site is ready. It's rocking and rolling, go in and do what you need to there. Uh, it's much faster. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, Jason, if you'll scroll down, like we just, we try and do some things like we added, you know, love team RGE here as a way of like adding personality. We have like the bottom of our uh, email um, section is that little sort of, um, it's a sense of, it almost looks like it was folded or it has this dimensionality to it that adds character. It's, it's just something different, right? It's like breaks what you can do now. Uh, in this case, our uh, current email platform, and we've we've had three or four along the journey, and so and we we try and be very agnostic about the products that we use. But currently, we're using uh, Campaign Monitor and their builder, and it's been incredible. So you can build very beautiful, really interesting emails with uh, a simple builder, uh, it, you know. And uh, this is you know very easy to put together each week, and Mike does that and does a fantastic job. So. We try and be consistent. We try and send out useful information. And for me, it's does this uh, part of the email, does the email on the whole serve the customer? What job did the customer hire this part of the email to do for them, right? And we try and be kind of honest about stuff like that. And, um, you know, try not to persuade people to read something that's not useful to them. Um, so, you know, knowing our audience, our emails are pretty dialed in on that. Uh, we do some tests and we look at how we can change some things within the scope of what's available to us as a small team. So, Matt, uh, how big, what would you add, bud? Um, yeah, I think um, that the personalization piece of, you know, the email geek first name, how we basically set that up, too, is that we, we mm -hmm. made up uh, first name letters so like if your name was A, we, you know, assign you a specific rap name and then we split our list into all those different segments. And then what you see here is a fallback if we don't have your name. Um, so fun things like that of just how do we can, you know, do that personalization piece, you know, that we've never seen before that we can copy from some other brands. Uh, and with this newsletter, too, I mean, a lot of the times we're setting this up at 2 a.m. and there might be mistakes and like things might go wrong, but we're definitely trying our best. And uh, some of the testing that we are trying to do is with pre-header text actually a lot. Um, so subject line and pre-header text really working together and kind of being fun in the inbox. Uh, but even to Jason's point about, you know, trying out some new accessibility you know, stuff, that's something that we are always striving to try to where I'm doing some fun, interesting stuff. Cause there is a little bit of pressure that Litmus probably has too about us trying to make the, the email look perfect and try out these new things. So we're, we're definitely trying our best, but still providing mm -hmm content uh, that's useful hopefully yeah the other thing about uh i mean you don't have to go back jason but uh, on um personalization those images if you haven't already check out uh, niftyimages.com yeah um the caveat they are a sponsor uh and we but we've had like this long relationship really good emails with, with our partners we try and always have partnerships that serve you all as an audience rather than just serve us like we couldn't have any other thing and incidentally like we 
any of the money that we make, 95% of it goes right back into the product. We just love this community and we are building a business and a product, but Nifty Images has been amazing for the last two and a half years. And man, it's really nuts what they're doing. Now you can like personalize images within images and you can use information from your database. You can use APIs and use APIs to um, customize imagery. I mean, it is neat. So, uh, or nifty. Yeah, <laughs> so it's pretty nifty, yeah. Right, uh, so go check it out. Um, yeah, I'm just big fans. And there, I think there might be some others that do that. So if it's not nifty, find some way to like dig into some of those uh, personalization yeah. tools. It's really neat. Yeah, for sure. That's something we, we haven't done a lot of uh, at Limus, but something I'd love to try a little bit more too. Um, so I talked a little bit about Litmus's process for thinking about content. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to, you guys want to walk through the really good emails process and kind of contrast that? Uh, sure. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do this, Matt Helbig. And then if you want to add anything, especially sure. kind of funny about Mike. So Mike, uh, who couldn't be here today, uh, he is one of the, uh, high ups over at, at Lonely Planet. So he's always like got some crazy meetings going on, but, um, you know, he does this each week. And so this list is an example of like, you know, kind of the snarky, silly way that we think about it. But, um, you know, the, the goal for us is, is to be funny um, and, and to find that, that rhythm that, that helps you and helps the audience know um, another way that they can tackle their emails, right? So we're gonna go through our current list of things that we've posted recently. And we're going to be looking for a theme, like something that sticks out. Um, and we all in our Slack channels, we keep, you know, RGE reads. Feel free to submit articles to us. We love that. We learn a lot. But we, you know, we're always scouring the internet for latest reads. So we're looking for those resources and we're, we're pulling in kind of best of class. So really good emails. Our brand is around curation, right? So we're not trying to be everything. Uh, there are other sites for that, but we're trying to say, we're choosing based on our own parameters, what we think is best in class, really good. Uh, and that includes articles. So, you know, we, we um, you know, really dial that in. Then we're sending those tests to ourselves. We're checking things, making sure that things look right, making sure that it feels good too. And you know what, we make mistakes and that's okay. Uh, but along the way, we try and catch as many of those as we can. Uh, and then Mike, you know, uh, has this great number six, where it's just like, oops, you know, totally effed up. All right, start over, you know. And then, you know, we try and select the right segments. Uh, for us, we have both uh, Monday and a Friday email. Uh, if you haven't already checked out Feedback Friday, our YouTube series, we do that on our Friday emails. But uh, we do this, what we've just been doing, reviewing newsletters on Fridays. Um, and then, yeah, like uh, our spiritual life, you can tell we're <laughs> praying to the internet guy all the time because uh, something always goes wrong. But, you know, we try and roll with the punches. So thank you all for being such a cool audience. It's It's been nice to serve you. I imagine that one of you guys has like a little statue of Sir Tim <laughs> Berners-Lee or something like in the corner <laughs> that you're praying to. Yeah. Uh, um, we do now. <laughs> yeah, nice. Matt Helbig, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, that number one is actually like the biggest thing for us is that, you know, we all have day jobs, we all do our own thing. And then really good emails has always been our outlet to try fun and new ideas that we want to do. So, you know, if we want to buy an Instagram ad, or we want to try something fun, or we want to like, you know, send a weird email that is like an art thing or something. So I think that's always been the, the goal with us is like, how do we provide value, but also like try, try and fund, you know, each each send is an, an opportunity for us to try something new. So. I think it's with our emails pretty much, that's just the goal. So if people open them and find value from them and it, it surprises or delights them, that's the, the main thing that we're going for. Cool, I think that's the perfect time to ask everybody if they wanna sign up for really good emails. Uh, so when he's gonna open up a poll via GoToWebinar uh, that will ask you if you'd like to receive the really good emails newsletter. Uh, you can get weekly tips and possibly a free pony, I believe. I don't know if it's a unicorn pony, but a pony of some sort. Um, so just, Pop open your answer and go to webinar. Uh, yes, please, even if Pony was a joke. Uh, no, but thanks for not sharing my email, obviously. Uh, if you want the Pony, if it was a level five Gorgamon from Pokemon, then that's cool too. Uh, <laughs> we were joking. What the hell's a Gorgamon? <laughs> 
Oh, yeah, it, you know, it's so high level, Jason, that people yeah. don't even know about it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't actually talk about it. I, my life could be in danger. So it's, it's the rarest of the rare Pokemon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we'll leave that open for a minute here. Uh, so it's allow all of you guys to get your answer in. Um, I don't know if we have any legal disclaimers around the pony, but maybe we should have added those too. But <laughs> right. it is what it is. We're not saying which how big the pony is. It could be a smaller pl plush pony. You know. There we go. That works. Or an yeah. emoji pony. <laughs> or an emoji pony. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so before we get to Q and A, uh, we just want to kind of round up our overview of our tips for sending better newsletters. Um, so these are the, the slides you might want to screenshot or take a picture of and reference when you're building your own email campaigns. Um, so what makes a really good newsletter? Uh, maybe we can each take one of these. Um, from a copy perspective, you know, you want to think about your subject line, your preview text. Uh, Matt Helbig was talking about how those two work together and really focusing in on that to get those opens. But then more importantly, use that content inside of your email to follow through on the promise of that subject line. Uh, we've seen some great level of personalization from really good emails, newsletters, and using nifty images. Um, so figure out ways in your own e email newsletter where you can add in that personalization, where you can use dynamic content, um, and then look at that voice and tone and you know how your, your brand and your email is viewed by your audience and work that into your campaign uh, to make sure that this newsletter is valuable, it it's, works for your audience, it understands your audience, and you're really providing that value for your subscribers. Um, Matthew, what do you think about design? What are some of the top tips that people should take away from this webinar? Yeah, so, you know, go and learn a little bit about typography um, and look at ways to make your email very scannable. Uh, that's a, a huge, easy win, right? Uh, another one would be, you know, try and play that design golf and get down to as few points of difference as you can. Um, another one is, you know, go on to really good emails or, you know, look at some of these emails and compare them to yours and see if you can see the differences. It's a, it's like a training. You're starting to like get a feeling for, oh, I see how that's easier to read. Um, and the more that you can train your eye to do that, uh, the more successful you'll be at, at spotting it in your own work. Matt Helbig, how about accessibility? Yeah, I think with mobile optimization, you know, like all the research that Litmus has put out, we're seeing, um, you know, that mobile views being almost the main view now, over 50%. Um, so that responsive design, mobile optimization piece is really important for us. And then whatever other interactivity or accessibility parts you want to put in, like the web fonts, things like that, bulletproof buttons, they are a little bit fancier, but I think they're definitely worth trying out. Um, and then, it is, you know, as we said, too, like all the emails that we looked at, uh, all the newsletters that we looked at today, are, you know, really use live text and make that a priority for all these newsletters. So I think each of those things, you know, making it accessible, thinking about that, it's, it's a big goal for us. And we think it's going to be really important moving forward in the email community. Totally. Yeah, Jason, sorry, I can follow up on that. I didn't fill out the list if you want me to. Go for um, it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the other quick thing was in your images and animated GIFs, just make sure your sizes are, are small enough not to really bog yeah. people down. Don't forget people are often viewing in mobile. Um, and if you're on T-Mobile like I am, like you've hit dead spots all the time and that counts. So, <laughs> yeah. um, And then, you know, with video, lots of really interesting new things to do there. Uh, make sure that you're degrading down to where you want to be and or, um, you know, lead people in with an image that looks like a video to, you know, a web link that, that easily gets them playing that quickly. Um, in terms of template systems, start now looking at design systems. Start looking yeah. at ways that you can reduce the choices you have to make to make your email faster and faster so that potentially those designers and developers are doing review rather than having to build every single time. Um, and try and keep your, your text live. It's going to be better for the future of email and it's uh, ultimately, I'm actually in favor of um, legislation or um, you know, some legal ramifications around some of this stuff in email. It's, it's there, it's ready to happen, the same way that Target was sued and that started to make a difference. So we need to see some of that happen in email. Um, and then with uh, navigation, you know, just make sure that people can easily get where 
your uh, testing and your um, site knows where they need to go. So get to know your audience and then make sure that email is serving them with the right navigation. And finally, with footer and legal, check with your legal team. It might be that so long as you have a link uh, to the privacy policy or terms of service, et cetera, that's enough. Uh, because that that giant legal text is not serving your customer, not really. For sure. Um, yeah. And you you know if you read ours, you can see how we kind of tease at that and play with it a little bit. So if you haven't already, go check out the, our legal text in the bottom of our emails. It's pretty funny. Yeah, totally agree with that. I <laughs> I hate disclaimers in email. Um, mm -hmm. Always think there's a better way to serve that, but it kind of comes down to your legal team and what they want. So that's uh kind of a crapshoot. Uh, so finally, we we kind of leave you with some of these questions. Uh, I know we're pretty close to the top of the hour here, but when you're thinking about your newsletters, when you're starting to design them, build them, you always want to keep these questions in mind. You want to think about whether or not that content serves the customer more than your own company. Make sure that you're delivering that value and you're solving a problem for your subscribers. Uh, we harped a lot about uh, on email accessibility and making sure that it, it's creating this good experience for everybody regardless of their ability. I think that's increasingly important um, as more of the world comes online or a lot of the world is aging and contending with some of these disabilities that make using email and websites harder. Um, and then finally, just think about whether or not you would look forward to getting this email. We all get newsletters we love. Uh, we all get newsletters that we hate. So do you want to create an email that you would love receiving or that you'd absolutely hate receiving? Uh, and just kind of keep that in mind. I, I like how you guys phrase this. How, how can my email suck less and wow more? Um, I think that's definitely something we want to keep in mind. Um, so I know we're we're pretty close on time here, Whitney, uh, but if you guys are okay with it, we can go a little bit over yeah, we're here all day. Our, our one o'clock limit sure. here. Uh, there's still, you know, close to a thousand people sitting on the call here. So let's pop open some of those questions and see if we can get some answers real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. We are getting a lot of questions around how to determine the cadence for newsletters. Mm. So I think an interesting thing with our brand is we actually send out a survey and ask people which days they'd want to receive the emails. So that's kind of maybe unique to us, but I think Matthew can maybe speak more a little bit more about that. Too. Yeah, I think um, if you can ask your audience directly, give them the opportunity to weigh in. Uh, but the other one is, uh, you know, you can use algorithms to test and see how people respond and adjust it uh, thereafter. And then there also is good data uh, and articles to read about the times of day uh, that are good to send. And that changes, of course, because once everybody says, oh, Tuesday is a good day to send, <laughs> everybody sends on Tuesday, yeah. now it's not a good day to send. So you got to keep up with that. Um, but, you know, read some articles, see what's working out there. Ask your, you know, fellows, like in the Email Geeks channel is a great place to say, hey, yeah. what are you guys learning, you know? Um, how are you, what are you finding is working for you? So um, be a community and find out there. But generally um, the ethic for me is what would serve our customer. And if you start to wonder if if you're sending too many emails, I would gather you you are, like if you're, if that's a question. And, but you know, go and see if you can interview a customer or even like give them a call, talk to somebody. Uh, if possible, talk to, you know, five to 20 people see what you can learn um, and go from there. So that's my ethic, but I tend to be on the design and brand and strategy side of things rather than uh, analytics. So Jason, what's your experience? Yeah, I, I mean, I think those are all great points. Uh, analytics wise, you can actually, yeah, you can absolutely kind of keep an eye on engagement levels. Uh, if you're sending something daily and you start to see those engagement levels, you know, whether that's opens, if that's click rates, click through rates, click to open rates. Mm -hmm. uh, inside of Litmus email analytics, we can actually track engagement as well. If you start to see those numbers drop off, then that's a really good indicator that people don't want to hear from you that much. Um, or if you see a lot of opt outs, unsubscribes, um, God forbid, you know, spam complaints and stuff like that. Uh, you want to just keep an eye on all those those things. But I, I really like the idea if in any way, shape, or form you can ask your audience what they want from you is going to be the best way to inform that cadence. And that could be like a dedicated survey email. Uh, a lot of 
emailers will marketers will include some sort of like uh, quick feedback mechanism towards the bottom of their email like you know mm -hmm. this is, is this too frequent uh, send me less and I'll take you to a subscribe page or like your mm -hmm. preference center and allow you to adjust that that cadence uh, whether that's like daily weekly monthly whatever you know um, anything you can do to make it easier for the subscriber to tell you what they want and give them what they want is going to be a lot better for you Yep. Yeah, I think it's also important to say, like, it's probably not going to be the same for everyone else either. You yeah, know? totally. Like, um, with email preference centers, maybe there are those true fans that want to receive a daily email about your brand, but other people might want just a weekly email. So setting up those preference centers and setting up those expectations early on, I think, will you know be successful for you. Cool. All right, what's next, Whitney? Awesome. All right, next up, how long is too long? What's the ideal scroll for a newsletter? <laughs> Oh, uh, the, the perennial scrolling question, yeah. Um, there there used to be like that huge debate and it still goes around, like whether or not there's a fold in email and whether or not, you know, something gets too long. I, I would hazard that you, you can go pretty long with most newsletters. It's good to try to keep them shorter and like focused on a couple of things. Like if you try to dump, you know, 30 blog posts in an email, nobody's gonna read through all of those. Um, but people are used to scrolling at this point in time uh they're used to seeing a lot of content and just kind of you know people it's the instagram generation people are used to just mindlessly scrolling through stuff um so you can you can have a longer newsletter uh but just make sure the stuff you're putting in there is valuable uh if you add a bunch of stuff in your newsletter and look at your analytics and nobody's reading beyond mm -hmm. the fourth article or something then cut it then you don't need the rest of that stuff and use other data to form like what you actually put in those like select spots. Um, but I, I, it's like everything in email, it depends on your audience. It depends on what content you have available to you. It depends on your production process and what resources you have available to create these emails. Um, right. So there's no one true answer for a question like that. Uh, it's all about using the data you have available to you. Um, looking at your subscriber behavior and trying to get insights there and then using that information to dictate your strategy. That's right. Yeah, I wouldn't add uh, anything to that. I, I do know, um, you know, for me, uh, the length of the email uh, can be psychologically changed when it has uh, visual breaks. So going back to that Marvel yeah. email, it felt really long, but one of the things that made it feel very long was that all the content was more or less the uh, the same visual style? So you had yeah. image, text, CTA on a card, and it was either a, a two up card or a one up card. Um, whereas if you have uh, a long email that is long form text uh, and broken up like a story and that has quotes or images or whatever, that can actually read visually, psychologically as as a shorter email. Uh, or if uh, similar to the um, uh, Envision email, like that was, uh, that's a fairly sizable email or can be, sometimes it's longer than others, but they break it up with different styles of content. So I'm able to scan down through and quickly see the types of content that matter to me. Uh, yeah, I think so, uh, a good example of that is that dense discovery newsletter, um, mm -hmm. which I know we all love that it was one of the examples we didn't get to, but we'll put on the blog post. And that's yeah. usually a really long newsletter, but it does have those like well defined sections and <laughs> like Twitter quotes and like different things breaking up those sections. So while it's long, it doesn't feel like it, it doesn't drag on and like it has such good content that people are going to scroll through it and click on all those links and like absolutely yep. love it. Awesome. All right, I have time for one more, Whitney. Okay, let's see. Got a good question about uh, newsletters that don't necessarily contain CTAs. Um, so they might be, you know, informational or product based. How do you guys have any ideas around how to measure success with that type of newsletter? That's yeah, that's definitely a tricky one because you don't have <laughs> that click through data available. So if you don't have those CTAs. Um, that's where something like Lemus email analytics might be helpful because we do track that engagement data. Um, so inside of EA, you can see whether or not somebody just uh, like completely ignored it. So they didn't look at it for, they opened it for less than like two seconds or something like that. Uh, if they were just skimming it for a little bit longer than that, or if they actually had it open for a long period of time. Um, so if you can get that kind of engagement data and 
see whether or not people are looking at your emails longer. That could be a really good indicator. Um, but there's other metrics out there, like uh, it's harder to kind of quantify, but you can look at like social responses, uh, just that general buzz about your emails. If people are talking about things online or like referencing it, uh, you could use that data to gauge whether or not these are effective newsletters. Um, or you can send, you know, every couple of months or something, send a survey to those subscribers and ask them directly for feedback on whether or not these are valuable, um, whether or not you should like tailor that that content a little bit more, like what they'd like to see more. Um, so it, it's harder to do because you don't have that direct quantifiable data, uh, but there's other ways to get that or like other things to look at to see whether or not that's a good, healthy email newsletter. Yeah, I think that is a interesting thing because you're, you know, speaking just to your audience, it's not really a dialogue anymore with a newsletter. So maybe if you do have some sort of link outs to some sort of customer support lines or something like that, if you have questions on the newsletter or in some way can interact with you or having that, you know, an actual reply email address versus the no reply so that if people have questions, they can reply to you. So I think, yeah, it might be hard if you don't have a single link in your email newsletter, but um, in some ways creating that back and forth with customers versus just speaking to them. Yeah, the, the other thing that you can read, um, inaction is an action. Um, well, let me say that slower. Inaction is <laughs> an action. So um, not un like if somebody chooses not to unsubscribe, there's something there that's still valuable for them. And I think that's interesting, right? So um, it, it is really helpful if you have CTAs to like get more engagement, ask more things, uh, even if it's like, um, asking your, your uh, readers, users for more feedback, but but just the fact that they are staying subscribed, that's interesting in its own right. So um, it's just one piece to, to be able to follow. Yeah, I think that's good. So we're, we're about 10 minutes over, uh, but I'm sure we got a lot more questions than those three. Um, so again, we're going to post a recap on the Litmus blog, litmus.com slash blog, uh, where you can go to get a copy of this recording. I uh, will post the slides up there. We'll post links to that really good emails collection with all these e emails that we were talking about, as well as uh, try to answer some of those questions and get our feedback up on that blog post. So that's definitely the best way to catch up on all this stuff in the webinar and all the stuff that didn't make it in the webinar. Um, but yeah, follow Litmus, go check out Litmus, uh, Litmus.com, follow us on Twitter, at Litmus app is our handle. Uh, Reallygoodemails.com is awesome if you want to check out the beta version, uh, which I'm not sure what the timeline is on a wider release, that becoming the main version, but Reallygoodemails.com <laughs> and beta.reallygoodemails.com. Uh, and then you guys are, I got confused by this because I thought you were at Twitter.com slash Reallygoodemails, but there's no ads <laughs> I found out, so it's too really long, good email. Too long. too long, yeah, yeah, Twitter's uh, damn character limits. I know, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so so thank you, Matthew and Matt, for joining us. Uh, obviously, we had way more to get through than we had time, uh, so hopefully this is the first of many webinars that we do together uh, awesome. around this topic and other topics. Um, so Love thank it. you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, check your email, check the blog uh, for follow-ups, and we will see you in the next Litmus webinar. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. If you have any feedback on the series, please leave a comment down below. Hit subscribe to keep up with future episodes. Thank you for giving a listen and letting our sponsors know you love really good emails.